Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby, Chapter 2. Revisionism, the Repression of a Theory. Let us make no mistake, this day and age has rejected me and all I had to give. That's a quotation from Sigmund Freud. Alfred Adler was the first to challenge the theories of the professor, as Sigmund Freud was known to his students. Adler's refashioning of psychoanalysis, which culminated in his break with Freud in 1911, contained all the elements found in the later contributions of the neo- and post-Freudians. Here, as later, the new formulations were executed in the name of a more humane, liberal, and social consciousness. Here, as later, a shift took place from theory and meta-theory to practice and pragmatism, from a sexual and psychic depth and past to a non-sexual psychic surface and present. Here, as later, subjectivity in the guise of the individual was added to psychoanalysis. Adler later dubbed his psychology individual psychology. Individual psychology tries to see individual lives as a whole, is of necessity oriented in a practical sense, or it is of necessity oriented in a practical sense. Freud's critique of Adler lay the groundwork for the critical theory critique of the Neo-Freudians. Both these critiques suggest the weakness of the post-Freudians. Liberal revisions traded the revolutionary core of psychoanalysis for common sense. Psychoanalytic revisionism, as worked out by Adler, was already associated with, re with a retreat to pleasantries and homilies. Freud's link to Hegelian tradition, with which he otherwise shares little, is in the deliberate renunciation of common sense. A person who professes to believe in common sense psychology, Freud is reported saying once, and who thinks psychoanalysis is far-fetched, can certainly have no understanding of it, for it is common sense which produces all the ills we have to cure. Orthodox psychoanalysis is oriented in the reverse direction, toward uncommon sense, exactly the far-fetched. The truth of psychoanalysis lies in its loyalty to its most provocative hypotheses. In psychoanalysis, only exaggeration is true. Adler and those who have followed him have labored to escape the uncommon concepts of repression, infantile sexuality, and libido, since they run counter to the prejudices of convention. Freud has ascribed Adler's popularity exactly to his flair for the ordinary. He has created a theory which is in tune with common sense, which recognizes no complications, which introduces no new concepts that are hard to grasp, which knows nothing of the unconscious, which gets rid at a single blow of the universally oppressive problem of sexuality. Freud was well aware of the conformist and conservative bent of Adler's revisions. He observed that the additions to or revisions of psychoanalysis contain what is already known from other sources, or what can be most easily related to it. Thus, what is selected with Adler is egoistic motives. What is left over, however, and rejected as false, is precisely what is new in psychoanalysis, and peculiar to it, the revolutionary and embarrassing advances of psychoanalysis. The irony that it was exactly socialists and liberals who cut out the revolutionary and embarrassing advances of psychoanalysis is the irony of the encounter of psychoanalysis with social and socialist thought. Freud himself, in discussing Adler's break with psychoanalysis, remarked on the importance of the socialist element in Adler. Ernest Jones also offered an explanation for the Adlerian shift away from the repressed consciousness to the sociological consciousness, the fact that the Adlerians were socialists. Yet it was exactly the shift that doled the critical and social powers of psychoanalysis. From the, from the beginning, the repression of psychoanalysis was announced as its liberalization. The young Adler considered himself a socialist. His first book in 1898 on the occupational and health hazards of the tailor trade had been called Synthesis of Socialism and Medicine. According to a biography by a friend, Adler was among a group of students who studied Marx, 
though he was not influenced by the economic theories of Marxism. Rather, he studied the sociological conception on which Marxism is based. Another account states that Adler was well acquainted with Marxist literature. In any case, it seems to have fallen to Adler to have written the、uh, first paper explicitly on Marx and psychoanalysis, on the psychology of Marxism. This was delivered in Freud's Vienna Society in 1909, but never published. Seems to be lost. It is preserved in some form by Otto Rank's notes of the session. According to the notes, Adler showed that an affective state sensitivity underlies class consciousness. Because this affective state always seeks to fend off degradation, it is impossible for the class conscious proletariat to adopt an attitude of fatalistic resignation. In conclusion, Adler wishes to stress that Marx's entire work culminates in the demand to make history consciously. The drift of Adler's concern, here as elsewhere, was essentially confined to a conscious dimension. First, organ inferiority compensation, degradation sensitivity, and later inferiority masculine protest. In the Vienna Society, shortly. Uh, following this presentation, Adler would make explicit his critique of Freud, and would leave the Freud circle. Freudian notions of repression and libido, sexuality and infantile for- formation, made way for inferiority and its compensation, a non-sexual desire to rule or be above. Adler questioned whether the driving force in neurosis was Freudian repression or an irritated psyche, and responded by indicating the importance of adjustment and education. Educational influences which smooth the way for the child are of far-reaching significance here. If one intervenes early with intelligent tactics, a condition results which might be described as one of carefree cheerfulness. Mistakes in education, on the other hand, Lead to such frequent disadvantages and feelings of displeasure that the child seeks safeguards. The liberal and practical bent of Adler's writing and thought is evident. Many of his early essays are concerned with correct education, proper upbringing, and so forth. The need for affection becomes the lever of education. A hug, a kiss, a friendly look, a loving word can only be obtained when the child subordinates himself to the educator. Via the detour of culture, a great many educational applications follow from this. It is not surprising that socialists interested in educational reform were drawn to Adler. Alice Rule Gerstel, the wife of Otto Rule, an anti-Stalinist communist, wrote in Freud and and Adler. That insofar as Adler sought to make men cooperative, he worked in his individual psychology as a democratic influence, and as a cultural preparer for socialism. Adler's early critiques of Freud removed any doubt about his fundamental break with psychoanalysis. In the in the Neurotic Constitution from 1912, he claimed that three of Freud's fundamental views were erroneous. The first was that the libido is the motive force behind neurosis. Rather, it was a neurotic goal. The second and third were the notion of the sexual etiology of neurosis, and the importance of infantile wishes. For Adler, these infantile wishes already stand under the compulsion of the imaginary goal. Neurosis develops out of the feeling of uncertainty and and inferiority, and demands insistently a guiding, assuring, and tranquilizing position of a goal. Later critiques by Adler would add little. In the difference between individual psychology and psychoanalysis from 1931, Adler wrote that Freud forgot the wholeness of the personality, which concept represents the essential,、uh, the essential contribution of individual psychology to modern medicine. This wholeness penetrates every psychological part phenomenon and colors it individually. The Freudian notion of an essential antagonism between the individual and a repressive society, between pleasure and reality, is dismissed. Rather, society is in fact the best friend of the individual, who is innately inferior and uncertain.
Social interest is the compensatory factor for the physical inferiority feeling of man. We can regard society as the most important compensatory factor for human weakness. The Adlerians, in the name of individual psychology, take the side of society against the individual. One Adlerian accuses Freud of advancing the notion of society the oppressor. To this Adlerian, what must be fault, faulted is not society's hostile frustration of the neurotic, but the neurotic's failure to adapt to society. The distance that Adler traveled from psychoanalysis can be found in nearly any passage of his writings from the 1930s. Depth, anal depth analysis makes way for moral rearmament. Neurotics and psychotics are themselves guilty of forsaking the benefits of a guiltless society. All failures, wrote Adler, listing neurotics, psychotics, criminals, drunkards, problem children, suicides, perverts, and prostitutes, are failures because they are lacking in fellow feeling and social interest. They approach the problems of occupation, friendship, and sex without the confidence that they can be solved by cooperation. Or to take a more specific analysis, narcissism signifies a lack of social interest and self-confidence. The person has not learned to do justice to the tasks with which he is confronted. The substance of the response of Freud to Adler prefigured the response of the Frankfurt School to the Neo-Freudians. Both objected to the substitution of everyday wisdom for the advances of psychoanalysis, the replacement of an instinctual dynamic by social factors or interest, repression in sexuality by insecurity and goals, depth psychology by surface psychology. For Freud and critical theory, to the point that sexuality, repression, libido are revised out of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis is itself repressed. Instead of analyzing sublimation, wrote Adorno of the Neo-Freudians, the revisionists sublimated the analysis itself. The inner dynamic of individual and society is severed and replaced by a mechanical model of the individual adjusting or maladjusting to values, norms, goals, and so on. These values and norms are not examined as the coin of a repressive society, but are traded and exchanged at face value. In the discussions in the Vienna Society that preceded the break with Adler in 1911, Freud denounced the revisions. The whole doctrine has a reactionary and retrograde character. Instead of delving into the unconscious, Adler sticks to surface phenomena, i.e. ego psychology and succumbs to the ego's own misconceptions. The ego's denial of its own unconscious is transmuted into a theory. Freud designated two objectionable features of Adler's work, an antisexual and a reductionist trend. The first denies the sexual basis for neuroses, while the latter ignores individual and distinct forms of psychic phenomenon. Rather, it asserts the sameness of all neuroses, deriving them all from the identical wish for superiority. These were more than minor differences. Wilhelm Steckel's comment that Adler's contribution was merely a deepening and extension of psychoanalysis was rejected out of hand by Freud. When Steckel maintains he finds no contradiction between these ideas and Freudian theory, I want to point to the fact that two of the participants do find a contradiction, namely Adler and Freud. In the history of the psychoanalytic movement, Freud further elaborated his objections to Adler. Adler presented a theory which was compatible and familiar to the ego. He adopted the viewpoint of the ego instead of uncovering the ego's own foundation. Freud did not simply reject ego psychology and this becomes important later, but argued that psychoanalysis was unique precisely in passing beyond the ego and exposing what was previously taboo. Sexuality, unconscious, libido. Adler takes the opposite view and stays exclusively on the surface. From the beginning, Freud claimed Adler never evinced any understanding of repression. Rather, he surrendered to the jealous narrowness of the ego, which was unwilling to acknowledge its own unconscious. In the new introductory lectures, Freud restated some of those objections. 
No matter what the case is, the Adlerians will declare that the motive is the wish to overcome inferiority. While there is something correct in this, a small particle is taken for the whole. Adler's later thought succumbs to the worst of his earlier banalization. It is conventional, practical, and moralistic. Our science is based on common sense. Common sense, the half-truths of a deceitful society, is honored as the honest truths of a frank world. The insane never speak in the language of common sense, which represents the height of social interest. If we contrast the judgment of common sense with private judgment, we shall find that the judgment of common sense is usually nearly right. He wrote in another book, the purpose of the book is to point out how the mistaken behavior of the individual affects the harmony of our social and communal life. Further, to teach the individual to recognize his own mistakes, and finally to show him how he may affect a harmonious adjustment to the communal life. <clears throat> that it was the socialist Adler and later liberal Neo-Freudians who rendered the psycho psychoanalysis of Freud apologetic and conformist formulates the problem. In brief, the political content and impact of the work of Adler and the Neo-Freudians were determined by the psychological and sociological concepts they employed, not by their manifest political attitudes. Similarly, Freud's subversiveness is derived from his concepts and not from his stated political opinions. This disjunction is absolutely crucial to recognize. The disjunction between the political, social, and truth content of concepts and the political, social outlook of those using the concepts. They are not identical. They often stand in contradiction. The apparent mystery of Marxists defending the theory of the conservative Freud against openly liberal Adler and his successors is founded on this just disjunction. Critical theory clings to the radical concepts of psychoanalysis, exactly what Adler and his followers weakened. If Freud was conservative in his immediate disregard of society, his concepts are radical in their pursuit of society where it allegedly does not exist in the privacy of the individual. Freud undid the primal bourgeois distinction between private and public, the individual and society. He unearthed the objective roots of the private subject, its social content. Freud exposed the lie that subject was inviolate. He showed that at every point it was violated. The neo and post Freudians enthusiastic as they were for the individual or person did not dig into these categories. Rather, they were spellbound by their surfaces. No matter how heretical the Neo and post Freudians imagined they were in theorizing about the values, insecurities, goals of the individual, they were safely following the official ideology of the private and autonomous individual and consumer. It is the context and content of these concepts that dictate the retrograde political meaning of their psychology. The psychoanalytic concepts of Freud, even against himself, trespassed on psychic private property. To the forces of conformity, Freud is guilty of breaking and entering the private psychic household. Even if Freud in the end justifies civilization, he has in the interim said enough about its antagonistic and repressive essence to put it in question. The reverse is true of the revisionists. Whatever criticisms of society they advance are absolved by the concepts and formulations that point toward health and harmony. It should be recalled that in any case, Freud was not simply a reactionary. Notably, his essay, Civilized Sexual Morality and Modern Nervousness, is a plea for changes in sexual morality, a plea to be found in many of his other writings. We have found it impossible to give our support to conventional sexual morality or to approve highly of the means by which society attempts to arrange the practical problems of sexuality in life. We can demonstrate with ease that what the world calls its code, or mor uh, its code of morals demands more sacrifices than it is worth. Or one can find statements such as this, a favorite of left Freudians. It goes without saying that a civilization which leaves so large a number of its participants unsatisfied and drives them into revolt neither has nor deserves the prospect of a lasting existence. <clears throat>
Similarly, one can overstate the socialism and liberalism of the Adlerians. It seems that Adler himself, at least by the later 1920s, quickly shed what there was of his socialist past and affinities. Moreover, according to one left Adlerian, Adler in his later years became a bitter opponent of the leftists among his adherents. He charged them with compromising his teachings, and he did everything possible to undermine them. This seems to be reflected in the writings of Adlerians, which in general show no more and often less overt left political sympathies than those of the Freudians. As remarked above, they facilely defend society against the individual, hardly a liberal position. The interest in society is transformed into a defense of society. From this perspective, Freud is feared as the radical he actually is. The attack on religion, writes one Adlerian, must also be seen as part of Freud's larger attack upon ethical standards and social interest generally. Yet the loyalties of Freud himself lay with modified repression, even if his concepts did not. Critical theory thinks through these concepts. It values Freud as a non-ideological thinker and theoretician of contradictions, contradictions which his successors sought to escape and mask. In this, he was a classic bourgeois thinker, while the revisionists were classic ideologues. The greatness of Freud, wrote Adorno, consists in that, like all great bourgeois thinkers, he left standing undissolved such contradictions and disdained the assertion of pretended harmony, where the thing itself is contradictory. He revealed the antagonistic character of the social reality. The characterization of Freud as a great bourgeois thinker illuminates the Marxist criteria for evaluating non-revolutionary thinkers. A parallel can be established between Marx's judgment on Ricardo and the post-Ricardians, and critical theory's appraisal of Freud and the post-Freudians. To Marx, Ricardo was the classic and best representative of bourgeois economics, since he articulated the contradictions of bourgeois society without glossing them over. He was scientifically honest, because unlike Malthus, he did not seek to accommodate his science to outside alien external interests. Those who came after Ricardo sought to reconcile what Ricardo left antagonistic. Hence, James Mill sought to systematize Ricardo, that is, to harmonize and neutralize him. What he tries to achieve, wrote Marx, is formal, logical consistency. The disintegration of the Ricardian school therefore begins with him. With the master, what is new and significant develops vigorously amid the manure of contradictions out of the contradictory phenomena. It is different with the disciple. His raw material is no longer reality, but the new theoretical form in which the master has sublimated it. The, dis <clears throat> the disciple seeks to explain away reality. The necessity to synchronize the contradictions, in turn, is derived from a shift in the historical conditions which makes these contradictions more threatening. Scientific opinion is increasingly faced with the choice of turning decisively critical or openly apologetic. Marx noted about two post-Ricardian economists, Bastiat and Carey, that they understood that socialism and communism were theoretically founded in classical political economy which had openly expressed the contradictions of society. Both of them, therefore, find it necessary to attack, as a misunderstanding, the theoretical expression which bourgeois economy has achieved historically in modern economics, and to demonstrate the harmony of the relations of production at points where classical economists naively designated this antagonism. The business of harmonizing the unpleasant contradictions of Freud was the joint task of Adler and the Neo-Freudians. The issue is not the direct influence of Adler on the Neo-Freudians, though that does not seem to be lacking, but a parallel effort, the logic and reasoning of their argument. The close relationship has been noted by many. Adler's loyal editor, Heinz L. Ansbacher, cites several textbooks indicating the affinity. It has to be said that Adler's influence is much greater than is usually admitted. The entire neo-psychoanalytic school, including Horney, Fromm, and Sullivan, 
is no less neo Adler Adlerian than it is neo Freudian. Adler's concepts of sociability, self assertion, self, and creativeness permeated the theories of the neo analysts. An article in an Adlerian journal, Karen Horney and Eric Fromm in relation to Alfred Adler, argues the same point. Clara Thompson herself, uh, herself a neo Freudian, also established the parallels that man seeks to solve his problems by the search for the, for the way to feel superior was an important discovery of Adler. It has much in common with Horney's idealized image and Sullivan's idea that maintaining an inadequate self system is a potential source for increasing anxiety. Further, Horney revised with new emphasis Adler's idea of the importance of the patient's neurotic goals. In Horney, as in Adler, the patient is sick not because of past events, but because in coping with past events, he or she established poor goals and false values. The critique of Freud that the Neo-Freudians advanced concentrated on his 19th century materialism that was allegedly impervious to individual and social factors. To correct this, they, like Adler, added social values and goals, notions of self and self-image, these additions were to take into account a relationship between the individual and society, which Freud had omitted. Critical theory reverses this appraisal. Freud's biologism, his apparent disregard of social values, is his strength. It constitutes the critique of bourgeois individualism. Freud's materialism peels back, in a way, the social norms and values to find the inner social dynamic. It is necessary, wrote Marx. It is necessary, wrote Max Horkheimer, to follow Freud's biological materialism, to stick to Freudian orthodoxy in this fundamental sense. Exactly what has been called the contribution of Adler and the Neo-Freudians, the discovery of self or personality, is the loss of the critique of the individual. The Freudian concepts expose the fraud of the existence of the individual. To be absolutely clear here, the Freudian concepts exposed the fraud, not so as to, as to perpetrate it, but undo it. That is, unlike the mechanical behaviorists, the point was not to prove that the individual was an illusion. Rather, it was to show to what extent the individual did not yet exist. To critical theory, psychoanalysis demonstrates the degree to which the individual is de-individualized by society. It uncovers the compulsions and regressions that maim and mutilate the individual. From this perspective, the formulations of the revisionists are already concessions to liberal ideology. When the revisionists do confront the ailment of the individual, they imagine it can be healed by mere invocation. Instead of dissecting the self to search for the internal and social injury, they appeal to its goodness and wholeness. Freud's analysis moves on another plane. Freud undermines, wrote Marcuse, one of the strongest ideological fortifications of modern culture, namely the notion of the autonomous individual. His psychology does not focus on the concrete and complete personality as it exists in its private and public environment, because this existence conceals rather than reveals the essence and nature of the personality. Rather, he dissolves the personality and bears the sub-individual and pre-individual factors, which, largely unconscious to the ego, actually make the individual. It reveals the power of the universal in and over the individuals. Personality, wrote Freud, is a loosely defined term from surface psychology that does nothing in particular to increase understanding of the real, success, or the real processes. That is to say, metapsychologically, it says nothing. But it is easy to believe that one is saying something meaningful in using it. The sub-individual and pre-individual factors that define the individual belong to the realm of the archaic and biological, but it is not a question of pure nature. Rather, it is second nature, history that is hardened into nature. The distinction between nature and second nature, if unfamiliar to most social thought, is vital to critical theory. What is second nature to the individual is accumulated and sedimented, and sedimented history. It is history so long unliberated, history so long monotonously oppressive. 
that it congeals. Second nature is not simply nature or history, but frozen history that surfaces as nature. Unlike the revisionists, Marcuse holds to Freud's quasi-biological concepts, but more faithfully than Freud himself, and against Freud unfolds them. The revisionists introduce history, a social dynamic, into psychoanalysis from, as it were, the outside, by social values, norms, goals. Marcuse finds the history inside the concepts. He interprets Freud's biolo biologism as second nature, petrified history. The chapter in Eros and Civilization, The Historical Limits of the Reality Principle, is a historical reading of Freud's concepts. Marcuse attempts to show that the repressive organization of the instincts is due to ex exogenous factors. Exogenous in the sense that they are not inherent in the nature of the instincts, but emerge from the specific historical conditions under which the instincts develop. This is no arbitrary construct tacked onto Freud. Rather, Freud himself, in his meta-theory, exactly what the neo-Freudians reject, derive the instinctual biology from a prehistory of violence and force. This is where Freud comes closest to Nietzsche. Civilization is a scar tissue from a past of violence and destruction. This is the authentic, materialistic, and historical core of Freud's thought. In the last resort, it may be said that every internal compulsion which has been of service in the development of human beings was originally, that is, in the evolution of the human race, nothing but an external one, wrote Freud in a small essay, Thoughts for the Times on War and Death. In an extract from a letter from Jones, uh, Prince from, sorry, in an extract from a letter that Jones prints, this is stated even more succinctly. Responding to an inquiry by Jones on the true historical source of repression, he wrote, every, every internal barrier of repression is the historical result of an external obstruction. Thus, the opposition is incorporated within. The history of mankind is deposited in the present-day inborn tendency to repression. The whole of Marcuse's historical reading of Freud is contained in these sentences. For Freud, the higher civilized values are grounded in lower ones. Social right is, is condensed social violence. Right is the might of a community. It is still violence, ready to be directed against any individual who resists it. The only real difference lies in the fact that what prevails is no longer the violence of an individual, but that of a community. Internalized in the individual, values derive both from the archaic conflict of the sons against the father and from the reenactment of the Oedipal conflict. The superego is founded on guilt, rooted in the failure of the uprising against the father oppressor. It must be said that the revenge of the deposed and reinstated father has been very cruel. It culminated in the dominance of authority. The dead now become stronger than the living had been, even as we observe it today in the destinies of men. What the father's presence had formerly prevented, they themselves have now prohibited in the psychic situation of subsequent obedience. Or in the less provocative language of the ego and the id, we can give an, give an answer to all those whose moral sense has been shocked and who have complained that there must surely be a higher nature in man. Very true, we can say, and here we have that higher nature. In this ego ideal or super ego, the representative of our relation to our parents. When we were little children, we knew these higher natures. We admired them and feared them, and later we took them into ourselves. As Freud himself knew, as Freud himself knew, this was the cutting and revolutionary edge of psychoanalysis. The refusal to accept social and individual values abstracted from the concrete uh, struggle of men and women against themselves and nature. Here, critical theory follows Freud. He is revolutionary in that his theory is critical and materialistic. Psychoanalysis pulls the shrouds off the ideology of values, norms, and ethics, which is the stuff of, of Adler and the post-Freudians. <laughs>
For this very reason, Freud considered the efforts of Ludwig Binswanger to add values to psychoanalysis conservative. The values that neo and post Freudians esteem are pieces of history scrubbed clean of their carnal and visceral origins. They prize them because they have forgotten their corporal origins. Marcuse is incorrect. Fromm revives all the time honored values of idealistic ethics as if nobody had ever demonstrated their conformist and repressive features. The 20th century modernizers confidently leave Freud behind as a bad memory from the 19th century. Yet, as Adorno has remarked, it is the revisionists and modernizers who witlessly reproduce 19th century theories. In their insistence on the role of values, morals, and milieu, they have upheld a dated mechanical and pre-Freudian schema. There is nothing new or novel about the idea of the individual as an autonomous monad, which is affected by outer forces. While they, the revisionists, unceasingly talk of the influence of society on the individual, they forget that not only the individual, but the category of individuality is a product of society. Instead of first extracting the individual from the social process so as then to describe the influence, which forms it, an analytic social psychology is to reveal in the innermost mechanism of the individual the decisive social forces. The revisionists rather posit the individual as an independent unity which is influenced from without. In bestowing on the individual autonomy and values, the neo-Freudians accumulate ideology. The critical path lies elsewhere. It entails burrowing into the individual and independent subject. It means penetrating the categories of individual and society, not merely juggling them. The individual before it can determine itself is determined by the relations in which it is enmeshed. It is a fellow being before it is a being. To shift terms for a moment, critical theory pursues the dialectic of the particular and the universal. Following Hegel, it finds the whole is the truth. That is, the particular is formed and informed by this whole, society. To discover society within the psyche of the individual, the universal within the particular, is to discover the, ob the objective nature of the prevailing subjectivity. It is to strip away the floss of the autonomous individual. Exactly this was the program of psychoanalysis. It revealed the sway of the universal, society, within and over the individual. Psychoanalysis, wrote Horkheimer, discovers the historical dynamics of society in the microcosm of the monad, as it were, and the mental conflicts of the individual. Psychoanalysis, wrote Marcuse, elucidates the universal in the individual experience. To that extent, and only to that extent, can psychoanalysis break the reification in which human relations are petrified. This was unacceptable to the Neo-Freudians. The relation of the particular and the universal, the individual and society, was not presented as one of mutual mediation. Rather, they presupposed a simple model of individual society interaction that operated on the surface. If their formulations on the individual society relations seem only slightly different from those of critical theory, the political meaning of the difference can be discerned in the from Marcuse dispute. Both claim the dialectical construction. In this exchange, the nature and social consequences of the productive, happy individual that Fromm prescribed were at issue. Marcuse, in his critique of the Neo-Freudians and Fromm, posed an either-or. Marcuse wrote, either one defines personality and individuality in terms of their possibilities within the established form of civilization, in which case their realization is for the vast majority tantamount to successful adjustment, or one defines them in terms of transcending content. This would imply transgression beyond the established form of civilization to radically new modes of personality and individuality incompatible with the prevailing ones. This would mean curing the patient to become a rebel. To Fromm, these words are proof that Marcuse forgot his own dialectical position to the extent of drawing a black and white picture. Rather, there are important qualifications to make. The qualifications are that there are exceptions 
I agree with Marcuse that contemporary capitalist society is one of alienation. That's a quote from Fromm. But I disagree entirely with the view that as a consequence, these qualities of happiness and individuality exist in nobody. Though, to be sure, they are rare. Yet to the extent that one addressed oneself to the exceptions as exceptions, to that extent, the social whole is repressed and forgotten. The alleged exceptions redefine and reformulate the totality of the whole society. They restrict and delimit it. The inner and depth dynamic of the individual society relation is forsaken for a take it or leave it attitude. With skill and effort, a destructive society can be safely ignored. Marcuse notes that the neo-Freudian distinctions between good and bad, constructive and destructive, productive and unproductive, are not derived from any theoretical principle, but simply taken from the prevalent ideology. The distinction is tantamount to the conformist slogan, accentuate the positive. Freud was right. Life is bad, repressive, destructive. But it isn't so bad, repressive, destructive. There are also constructive, productive aspects. Society is not only this, but also that. Left out is how, under the impact of civilization, the two aspects are interrelated in the instinctual dynamic itself, and how the one inevitably turns into the other by virtue of this dynamic. The point is not that love and happiness are mere ideology. Crucial, wrote Marcuse in a rejoinder to Fromm's response, is the context in which they are defined and proclaimed. They are defined by Fromm in terms of positive thinking, which leaves the negative where it is, predominant over the human existence. If the difference between the two positions seems like a minor philosophical quarrel, the result is not. The year following Eros and Civilization from 1955 and this exchange, Fromm published The Art of Loving, a book that suggests the distance separating the Neo-Freudians from critical theory. Fromm opens on the same note made in his rejoinder to Marcuse. He acknowledges the negative power of society and advises that the art of loving is rare. In a culture in which these qualities are rare, the attainment of the capacity to love must remain a rare achievement. Only on the last four pages does an important question arise. How can one act within the framework of existing society and at the same time practice love? Footnoting Marcuse, Fromm repeats his argument. One must admit that capitalism is in itself a complex and constantly changing structure which still permits a good deal of non-conformity and of personal latitude. However, people capable of love under the present system are necessarily the exceptions. The either or that Fromm are objected to in Marcuse is found in his own thought. In Marcuse, it is defined by the political and social whole. Its meaning derives from its place within the social contradictions, on either or, in either or of complying or resisting society. With the Neo-Freudians, it is shifted to the individual, personal and psychological, which are only loosely in contact with society. The exceptions that Fromm discovers and promotes are the exceptions that liberal society has always flaunted as proof of its essential benefic beneficence. With a little effort at home, anyone can be spared a deadly and loveless world. Love and happiness are repairs for the do-it-yourselfer. Yet, to critical theory, these exceptions are confirmations of the very brutality and injustice that ideologically lead be. <sighs> Yet, to critical theory, these exceptions are confirmations of the very brutality and injustice they ideologically leave behind. Sensitivity and warmth for the few and coldness and brutality for the rest is one of the stock notions and realities that feed the ongoing system. Love within a structure of hate and violence decays or survives only as resistance. The Neo-Freudians escape the social contradictions that sink into the very bowels of the individual by repressing them. A half-truth is contained in the Neo-Freudian revisions. As there is in all revisionism, the notion that reality is historical and theory, if it is to be adequate to that reality, must also be historical and must also change. This returns to the problem of orthodoxy and revisionism. Again, what is in question in defining these terms within both Marxism and Freudianism is not change per se, 
but the quality or content of change. There is no repudiation of change within psychoanalysis, but it is change that remains loyal to the content of the original concepts. This dialectical loyalty demands both fidelity to the critical edge of the concepts and allegiance to a historical reality. To critical theory, psychoanalytic concepts undergo change in direct relation to their object, the individual. Psychoanalysis as a theory is embedded in the same historical dynamic that created as well as mutilated the individual. Adorno's statement that the pre-bourgeois order does not yet know psychology, the over-socialized one knows it no longer, is incomprehensible if psychoanalysis is abstracted from the fate of the individual. Psychoanalysis as a science of the individual survives exactly as long as the individual survives. It is historically situated where the individual is situated. situated. It was unknown where the individual was yet to emerge as a semi-private being, and it is becoming unknown and forgotten in the post-bourgeois order where the individual is superfluous. The story of the rise, fall, and forgetting of the individual is the tale of the rise, fall, and repression of psychoanalysis. Some of the basic assumptions of Freudian theory have become obsolescent to the degree to which their object, namely the individual as the embodiment of id, ego, and superego, has become obsolescent in the social reality. That was a quote, I'm not sure from where. The individual of classic psychoanalysis managed to eke an existence out of the relatively underdeveloped market. This was the truth in the early bourgeois theories of the free individual and the free and, com and competitive market. A truth, that is, which was confined to the middle classes. For the proletariat, the notion of the free individual was always a sham. With the centralization and synchronization of the market, the individual lost its relatively independent and private sources of sustenance. Finance capital, unlike liberalism, abhors the anarchy of competition and seeks organization. It wants direct domination. The individual that had subsisted in the recesses and corners of the market is eliminated by organized capital. Under monopoly capitalism, the individual has only the chance of a short reprieve. As the early forms of competition pass into direct control and manipulation, the individual exits. The social power structure, Adorno wrote, hardly needs the mediating agencies of the ego and individuality anymore. Mediation turns into immediate command and suggestion. The very notion of individual psychology becomes problematic. In a thoroughly reified society in which virtually no immediate contacts exist between men and virtually no, sorry, and in which, oh fuck. In a thoroughly reified society in which virtually no immediate contacts exist between men and in which every man is reduced to a mere function of the collective, the psychological processes, although, per, although they persist in the individual, no longer appear as decisive forces of the social process. The psychology of the individual, according to Adorno, has lost its emphatic meaning and substance. Yet that which is obsolete is not by this token false. Insofar as the psychoanalytic concepts are wedded to a classic capitalist model, they can throw into relief the subsequent historical evolution of a psychic and extra-psychic reality. The erosion and corrosion of the individual in the immediate context of the individual, the family. These are decisive secondary changes of the transformation from free to monopoly capital. The family is one of the crucial terms. Social changes are refracted through the family and in turn affect the formation of the individual. The mental household of the individual is constructed out of the family household. As the latter shrinks to an efficiency unit, so does the former. The single most important fact in the transformation of the family is the decay of the economic significance of the father as the relatively independent provider and power. As, and power. as the father loses the remnants of independent authority and individuality, the family loses its resiliency. If there are positive and democratic features of this process, there are also negative ones. The child ego once nurtured and scarred by the family is no longer nurtured but simply integrated. The actual weakness of the father within the society, which indicates 
the shrink of, shrinkage of competition and free enterprise extends into the innermost cells of the psychic household. The child can no longer identify with the father, no longer can accomplish that internalization of the familial demands, which with all their repressive moments still contributed decisively to the formation of the autonomous individual. Therefore, there is today actually no longer the conflict between the powerful family and the no less powerful ego. Instead, the two equally weak are split apart. Critical and psychoanalytic theory cannot be indifferent to such developments, developments which here can only be stated, not demonstrated. The concepts of ego and superego are themselves affected by the restructuring of the family. The reformulating of the concepts in particular to account for the ego has in fact characterized much of the psychoanalytic and neo-psychoanalytic literature for the past 30 years. It is hardly accidental that ego psychology, psychology that predominantly explores the ego, emerges just when the ego as an autonomous unit turns openly suspect. Yet the particular readings and interpretations of the ego diverge widely. Ego psychology of the psychoanalytic revisionists took up the ego as a welcome relief from Freud's excessive attention to the id and unconscious. Like the rest of their program, it promised to neutralize Freud's materialism and biologism. Furthermore, this ego psychology fit in well with the newer psychologies of self, self-image, and so on. Critical theory reverses this approach. The ego is studied not as, in, not as an advance over or repression of psychoanalysis, but as an inner development of psychoanalysis. Attention to the ego does not demand blindness toward the instinctual and social dimensions that constrict and choke the ego. Where one dates the emergence of ego psychology depends on one's loyalties. The Adlerians would date it from Adler, the father of ego psychology, and draw direct and indirect links to the later developments of psychoanalysis in the Neo-Freudians. The first pioneering steps towards ego psychology within psychoanalysis were taken by Alfred Adler. The Freudians, of course, are anxious to deny this origin and usually date ego psychology from Freud's own later works, e.g. the ego and the id from 1923, or from the works of Freudians, especially Anna Freud's The Ego and the Mechanism of Defense from 1937, Heinz Hartmann's Ego Psychology and the Problem of Adaptation from 1939, and Hermann Nunberg's Ego Strength and Ego Weakness from 1939. As Hartman maintained from the first, referring to the Adlerians, psychoanalytic ego psychology differs radically from surface psychologies. Yet, substantively, if not factually, the Adlerians may be correct. The prevailing ego psychology, even in its psychoanalytic form, does not differ essentially from, from surface psychology. For this reason, it is Adlerian and pre-Freudian, and its lack of interest in the libido and the unconscious. Briefly, Heinz Hartmann, probably the most important of the Freudian ego psychologists, detached the ego, or part of the ego, from the unconscious and libidinal drives. He dubbed this the conflict-free ego sphere. Not every adaptation to the environment or every learning and maturation process is conflict. The critical edge of Freud is blunted. The aim of psychoanalytic therapy is to help men achieve a better functioning synthesis and relation to the environment. As Adorno wrote of Anna Freud's book, it evinces the reduction of psychoanalysis to a conformist interpretation of the reality principle. In ego psychology, the same expurgation of psychoanalysis takes place as with the Neo-Freudians, who themselves draw upon psychoanalytic ego psychology as with Adler, the socializing of psychoanalysis in seeking to account for the reality of society drains psychoanalysis of its blood. With Hartman, even if he is alert to the dangers of so sociolo sociologism, <laughs> the indwelling tendency of his concepts to follow a recent critique is one of reduction. Those who laud these theoretical developments within and outside psychoanalysis have told the unpleasant truth pleasantly. Ego psychology grinds down the cutting edge of psychoanalysis. It refashions the outlandish quality of psychoanalysis in contemporary garb. Just as conflict is the central notion in Freud's work, adaptation is central in Hartman's. <laughs>
compared to Freud, Heinz Hartmann is another breed altogether. Not a revolutionary, but, but a practical earthbound traditionalist. Another sympathizer candidly admits, there was a radicalism, even a shocking quality to many of the early psychoanalytic formulations. Contemporary ego psychology has a tamer, more healthy-minded quality. Or in a similar vein, it has been noted that without the revisions which the Neo and post Freudians have brought to psychoanalysis, oh no, one may doubt whether it could have been as attractive to middle class Americans. Sorry. Finally, one theorist who draws the links between psychoanalytic ego psychology, the Neo Freudians, and the post Freudians sums up the contribution of what he calls ego psychology's great departure from classical doctrine. With Freud, the scope of the ego was minimized and was held in low esteem, but ego psychology paves the way for a positive appreciation of the human ego. This is joined with the rediscovery and the rehabilitation of the old-fashioned idea of the self by the Neo-Freudians. Critical theory does not join the general approbation. The positive appreciation of the ego is the song and dance of social amnesia. It forgets the pain by whistling in the dark. What is crucial, however, is not to ignore the study of the ego, but to denounce the, the presupposition that the study of the ego is inseparable from its praise. While undeniably there was a shift in the later Freud toward the ego, this was a shift that occurred within a psychoanalytic framework. The unconscious libido, and so on, were not surrendered, rather they were explored within the ego itself. Freud did, in The Problem of Anxiety in 1926, dissociate himself from those psychoanalysts who, following his earlier work, made into a Weltanschauung the theory of weakness of the ego in relation to the id. While Freud eschewed all Weltanschauung, several pages later one can find a statement that seems unrepentant. The act of repression has demonstrated to us the strength of the ego, but it also bears witness at the same time to the ego's impotence and to the uninfluenceable character of the individual instinctual impulse in the id. Adorno has remarked that the defect of neo-Freudian and positivist thought is that it is unable to comprehend the ego as simultaneously a psychic and an extra-psychic phenomenon, the ego as dialectical. Within a positivist consciousness, attention to ego psychology proceeded only at the cost of id psychology. It remained imprisoned in the either-or logic. Freud sought to retain both moments and, moreover, foresaw clearly that a turn to ego psychology would entail a renunciation of the specific gains of psychoanalysis. Ego psychology, psychology formed the prehistory of psychoanalysis. Hence, ego psychology within psychoanalysis must have a different look from non-psychoanalytic ego psychology. A letter, of Freud, a letter of Freud to Jung in 1909 is a testament to Freud's insight, showing him keenly aware of the dangers of an either-or mentality and of the threat in Adler and Jung of ego abstracted from depth psychology. We have already agreed that the basic mechanism of neuro... Neuros, neurosogenesis is the antagonism between the instinctual drives, the ego as the repressing force, the libido as the repressed. It is remarkable, though, that we human beings find it so difficult to focus attention equally on both of these opposing drives. Thus far, I have really described only the repressed, which is the novel, the unknown, as Cato did when he sided with Cosa Victa. I hope I have not forgotten that there are also that that there also exists a victrix. Here Adler's psychology invariably sees only the repressing agency and therefore describes the sensitivity, this attitude of the ego towards the libido as the basic cause of neuroses. Now I find you on the same path. That is because I have not sufficiently studied the ego. You are running the risk of not doing justice the to the libido, which I have evaluated. Critical theory is loyal to both dimensions. It accepts and studies psychoanalytic notions of the weak ego, 
This, however, is situated in a social dynamic that turns into an instinctual one. A repressive society drives the ego to regression and unconsciousness so as to irrationally subsist. Critical consciousness and the autonomous ego, inextricably linked, dissolve under the impact of a massified society. Marcuse uses a term of Franz Alexander's, corporalization of the psyche to suggest the psychic process, the translation of psychic energy into unconscious automatic reactions. The reality principle asserts itself through a shrinking of the conscious ego in a significant direction. The autonomous development of the instincts is frozen, and their pattern is fixed at the childhood level. The psychoanalytic concept of narcissism captures the reality of the bourgeois individual. It expresses the private regression of the ego into the id under the sway of public domination. Adorno considers it one of Freud's most magnificent discoveries. It is, it, it is no accident, according to Adorno, that Freud turned the ego turned to ego psychology and narcissism narcissism, in such works as group psychology and the analysis of the ego, that is, in direct reference to mass and social phenomena. The drive of this small work, which is one of the most cited by the Frankfurt School, is to show the inseparable relationship between the individual and mass psychology. From the very first, individual psychology is at the same time social psychology as well. Narcissism comprehends the dialect dialectical isolation of the bourgeois individual. Dialectical in that the isolation that damns the individual to scrape along in a private world derives from a public and social one. The energy that is directed toward oneself rather than toward others is rooted in society, not organically in the individual. Narcissism means, in psychoanalysis, libidinally cathecting of one's own ego instead of the love for other men. The mechanism of this shift is not the least the society that puts a premium on the hardening of each individual, the naked will to self-preservation. Narcissism is the stuff not only of the irrational mass movement, but of the irrationality of everyday life, because it is unconscious. The ego regresses, making it making its supreme sacrifice that of consciousness. If the history of psychology is the history of forgetting, Adler was the first, but by no means the last, to forget. His revision of psychoanalysis was a homemade remedy to assuage the pain of the unfamiliar psychoanalysis. The notions that he and the Neo-Freudians would champion were borrowings from everyday prattle, the self, values, norms, insecurities, and the like. They were offered as antidotes to Freud's illiberalism. Yet just this constituted Freud's strength. His refusal to bow to reigning wisdom, his exploration of a tabooed and erotic psychic underground that officially did not exist. The subjectivity and social factors the revisionists added to correct Freud's excesses did the trick. They brought psychology back into the fold.